Good day, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's forum on the Open Access app. Uh, my name is Peter Murray, and I am the open source community advocate at Index Data and the host for today's forum. This session is being recorded and will be posted to the Folio playlist on the Open Library Foundation YouTube channel. As an open forum, participants can see each other and all of the questions submitted, and we have muted everyone except the speakers to ensure good sound quality. Uh, we do value and anticipate and encourage your participation in this topic. Uh, please use the question box within Zoom to enter questions. Um, as the uh, screen share is happening, uh, and a question comes up, uh, please put that in uh, uh, at that time. Uh, other questions I will hold to the end. Again, uh, as the screen sharing is, is happening uh, and a uh, uh, question occurs to you, uh, please put that into the question and answer box uh, and I'll stop the speakers at that point uh, and ask them uh, the question. Uh, if you like to tweet, uh, please use the hashtag Folio Forum, uh, and I can relay those comments and, and questions to the panelists as well. Uh, like all Folio meetings and events, this forum is guided by the Folio Community Code of Conduct, a link of, uh, to which can be found on the wiki.folio.org homepage. Uh, for the forum today, we have Jorn Mouchal and Owen Stevens. Uh, Jorn is the local folio project lead at Leipzig University and the open access SIG convener. Uh, Owen Stevens uh, is uh, uh, part of uh, from his consulting group and the open access app product owner. Uh, and today, I believe we will start with uh, Bjorn. Yes, thanks, Peter. Thanks for hosting us today. Yes, my name is Bjorn. Uh, Peter has already uh, said um, I'm the convener of the Open Access SIG, and uh, I'm also representing the library which is funding this development, um, which is the Leipzig University Library. Um, the Open Access app is approaching completion of version one, and uh, we thought it would be useful to report on this new Folio app to a wider audience. So very welcome everyone and uh, glad to have you here today. As you know, um, open access is by no means a new field in universities and uh, libraries. Uh, the more surprising for me is uh, that as far as I know, none of the other library management systems and platforms on the market provide functionalities in this direction. So for processing open access publication requests, and uh, related costs, uh, cost information and related workflows. Over the last decade, some libraries have extended their repository software to map uh, such cost information for open access, for example. Um, but the work in our SIG has shown that much more is needed uh, to do this job in a proper way. And that's why we are very happy that we could implement uh, the OI app in Folio and uh, I have to say that it was a very great experience to see how quickly a new community, in, in this case, uh, open access community, could be established um, in Folio or within the existing Folio framework. And uh, in this regard, I would like to emphasize that the open access app would not be what it is today without great input and uh, support of our SIG experts from around the world. Um, for us as a library, it feels so much more sustainable to invest in a software which is based on such a great experience and, and input. And that was uh, one of the key reasons we, uh, we decided to go with Folio in 2000, 2018. And um, that's why I want to say thank you to all of our SIG participants for your time, your expertise over the last one and a half years. And I, I really enjoy working with you and I hope that we will work together in the future. And on the same level, I would like to thank you, Owen, for your fantastic work as product owner. 
this is uh, something that we as a library could not have done on our own. And um, yes, equally a big thanks to Jill at KINT Knowledge Integration for the UX UI considerations and uh, prototyping. And many, many thanks to Jack, Ian and the entire development team at KINT for making this app happen. And it's, it's a pleasure working with you all guys. Thanks to all others who helped us, um, Dennis from Acquisition, but also others from the community. And um, yeah, finally, you see the slide. Um, thanks to our sponsor, uh, the European Regional Development Fund and the Free State of Saxony, without which uh, this development would not have been possible. Thank you. And now I hand over to Owen for the actual presentation and demo. Thanks, Bjorn. Um, so, um, so just to give some background, um, I think uh, Bjorn has already mentioned, but essentially we see there are a growing number of publisher agreements that include open access publication options. So maybe that, um, that the agreements that you're entering into now with publishers, that there's an offer of doing read and publish agreements or some um, discounted um, costs for APCs under the agreement. Um, and that's becoming just more common generally. Um, additionally, in some institutions, we know not all, but in some institutions, libraries are responsible for managing some funds to uh, pay for article and book processing charges that are traditionally associated with open access publications. So it's in order to manage that sort of information um, related to open access publication that we've uh, been developing this open access request application uh, in Folio. In terms of what the open access request application supports um, right now, um, it's recording the details of a request to publish uh, an open access book or journal article. So a request from an author in your institution, they want to publish this open access or it's being published open access and you want to record those details. Um, the um, application provides support for processing that request through any locally defined workflows. So it's down to the institution using the application to define what those workflows might be. But um, the um, the uh, the application is designed to support that um, and help ensure that all aspects of of a re request or a publication are completed, including payment of any charges and recording the relationship to a publisher agreement. So obviously, uh, um, in in a lot of cases, there may be publications of open access that are related to a particular publish agreement um, and you want to just be able to group those together and say okay that all of these um, publications have happened as a result of this read and publish agreement or this other transformational agreement. Um, the, the application is integrated with um, both the folio agreements application which which is where you can manage the publisher agreement details so um, that uh, an existing application in Folio um, focused around electronic resource management, but um, able to also record information about open access um, agreements, whether that includes uh, read access to journals or, or not. Um, and also integration with the Folio invoices and finance applications, again, existing applications that already do uh, it, you know, have rich functionality in those areas, but um, from our perspective, um, we can make sure that we are the open access aspects are integrated into those so that you can manage the payment of invoices and um, any budget management uh, that you want to. And for those of you managing open access budgets within the library budget structure, that then will be able to be reflected in, in your overall budget structure in Folio, um, if you're using Folio for that. And um, finally, 
um, we support reporting on those open access publications in an open APC compliant format. So open APC collects information about um, the costs and, and amount of open access publishing related to article processing charges, book processing charges and transformational agreements. And um, there are uh, reports built into in formats that, that they can accept, um, which may be useful if you need to report directly to them or might be useful more generally just uh, for local reporting. So before I, what I intend to do mainly in this forum is, is demonstrate the application itself. Um, but before I dive into that, I just want to um, give some terminology I might use during the demonstration. So in the application, we have requests. Um, so each request represents a request to publish a work, which would typically be a, a book or a journal article as open access, or it might be that that's already happened and you're, you're recording it in retrospect, but it, it's essentially that's what, that's the main thing in the application is, is what we call the request. Um, and that holds all the other information about what's being published um, and who's um, publishing it or uh, which author is making the request in your institution uh, or is, respond is the corresponding author from your institution. Um, we have charges, which are represent any charges made for the publication. So that could be an APC, um, an article processing charge, or uh, might be some other charge like a color charge. Um, there's no requirement for you to record charges. So if, if there was no charge for a particular uh, publication or you didn't want to record the charge um, or you want to record some charges and not others, you're interested in recording APCs but not colour charges, that's all fine. It's completely up to you exactly how much detail you want to record there. But um, that's supported and they integrate, as I've said, with the invoicing and budget management in Folio as well. Um, we have what we call checklists, which represent a, a set of tasks or checklists, items that need to com be completed for each request. Um, so that helps you work the, this idea of having a workflow, a series of steps that um, you need each um, request to go through. You can record information about people, um, which is intended for people in your organization who are uh, in some way related to the request, typically the corresponding author, or maybe uh, another contact in the department if, if there's an administrator or someone who's um, helping manage the requests there. And obviously for articles, the journals in which the publications are being made. So the, the journals um, that are being published in. Um, and you, hopefully you'll see how that all fits together as I demonstrate the system. Um, and as Peter says, if as I'm doing the demonstration, um, you have questions about particular detail, please do ask and, and Peter can um, get me to stop and clarify. Um, and there'll be chance for, for any other questions at the end as well. Um, so I've, I've already covered this, I think, but just to, to be, to, to, to say that when we talk about like the agreements, um, the invoice and invoices lines and the funds, um, those are managed, um, by other applications in the, in the folio, um, product, um, and, uh, they're, they're, they're not compulsory to use. You could use the open access um, application by itself, but but it would be slightly less rich in its functionality if you did that. So obviously the things that are um, about the agreements with publishers, they're best recorded in the publisher, in the agreements app. The things that are about invoices and invoice signs obviously need to li live in the invoices app. So um, you can use it kind of independently or mainly independently, but um, uh, it's richer if you use it with all of the other integrations that we provide. Okay, and I think with that, I will move on to the demonstration. I will pause just to take a, a drink and see if there are any questions that uh, um, arise from that first set of slides. So far, uh, no questions. Uh, grab your drink and, and press on, please. Okay.
Okay, so I will switch to um, Folio. So hopefully you can see Folio on my screen now. And um, for those of you who aren't already Folio users, um, this is, uh, I've just logged into one of our uh, demonstration systems that's available for uh, use uh, online. Anybody can uh, get the login details to this and, and try it if, if they wish. Um, and uh, so this is kind of quite a fully functional system and it has the latest version of all the different folio modules on it, uh, folio applications on it. Um, and the applications are accessed from this top bar and this drop down. You can see there's quite a lot of different applications. You might not use all of these in your institution, so you might not see them all if you, you know, if you're not using them all. But um, at the moment, here's the open access public uh, uh, application. And if I go into that, um, I've pre-populated this with a lot of demonstration data. Um, obviously, if you came to it um, uh, and it, and that hadn't happened, um, it would be a blank screen at this point waiting for you to create your first request. Um, one of the things, and I'll, I'll talk through some of these options as we go, with the open access application is there's, there's quite a lot of options that, that you can set uh, for your institution. So when I'm demonstrating things today, those are decisions that I've made. I've tried to make realistic decisions and um, I've tried to come up with realistic examples, but I should say that um, I'm though my background is as a librarian and I have worked with open access materials in the past, I don't currently do that job. So um, any mistakes that I've made uh, or things where you think, well, it just doesn't work like that, or I wouldn't do it like that, that's fine. Um, uh, it's probably my mistake and uh, hopefully that won't uh, affect any of the basic underlying functionality I'm trying to demonstrate here. Um, but do feel free again to ask if you think, well, I don't think we'd do it like that, but would it support us doing it another way? Then the answer is, I hope, going to be yes, but, but feel free to ask for that clarification. So I'm going to um, work an example here where we where I'm uh, working in a library and I've been told about a publication um, that's going to be made open access. So I've been contacted by an author. And so my first action is to create a new publication request. So you can see me go through the details of, of recording a publication request. So um, uh, the request date, let's say, is today and it's an open request because it's just started. Um, there are some other options here. Obviously, I can't record a request for closure, a reason for closure, because the, the request is open, I've just said. Um, but when it came to, to saying this request is done, I might there might be different reasons why, um, how it's finished. So that might be it's closed because we're not funding it, we're not doing any more work with this, or it might be because it's just been published and everything's okay and um, it's uh, being completed um, satisfactorily and, and everything is finished with it. But that status there, the open close status, is just to allow you to track what are the currently things that I need to worry about and what versus all the stuff that happened in the past historical requests that are all done and dusted. Um, I can also here um, check this box if this is a request for retrospective open access. A bit more common, I think, with um, with uh, maybe um, book open access where a book has been published and then later there's a decision to to take it from the publisher's backlist and make it open access retrospectively. That's what that checkbox is there for. Um, requests are automatically allocated a number by the system, but if you wish to also, if you've got say requests coming in through a help desk system or some other system where you've got another tracking number, you can add tracking numbers here um, that, that are from other systems or other request uh, IDs that you have. Um, you might not have any, um, I'm, I'm not going to bother in this case, it will get a number internally in the system anyway. So um, I've got an example request here um, that's come from someone called Karen Binder. So my first thing is that this is the corresponding author for the request. So I'm just going to look for them and they're not in the system at the moment. 
So um, I'm going to create a new person record for them. So um, and I think I have an ORCID ID. Oh, I misspelled their name. That's a good start. Um, it's Karen. And as you can see, I can record email address um, and phone numbers. There are actually more contact details I can put down for a person as well, but this is just a quick create box so I can get this person added without having to go away from the request. So if I um, do this, we can look at the full person record later, but um, you can see that that's created that person. I have a link to their ORCID profile if I need it, um, having put in the ORCID ID. And below that, I can record which um, part of the institution they're in. These are very generic names, level one and level two. They're meant to represent different organizational structures in your organization. Um, and we have very generic labels here because we know that what people call these levels of organization just varies a lot. So in this case, I've got um, a number of schools at the top level. Um, and that's a drop down list. So I know that um, she's in the School of Education. Um, they're in the School of Education. And if there was some other clarification I wanted to put in here, like um, teaching research group, I can just enter that as pretext. So it just gives me two ways of recording um, where they're situated in the organization for later reporting. The nice thing about this one is because it's from a drop down list and this list is defined by the by you. It's not like it's not pre-delivered. You're not stuck with this list. You you can put in whatever organizational structure you want there. Um, but by having that, then obviously that brings that consistency at that level. So if you want to do reporting on um, how many requests have been done by the School of Education, that would be then possible. We know it was always consistent, whereas this one is just for like additional clarification. So if you've got lots of subgroups or small research groups or cross-cutting groups underneath that, then you can record that as well. Owen, uh, before we leave corresponding authors, uh, yeah. is there a connection to MARC authorities? No, there isn't. These are completely independent of any um, cataloging records. OK, a uh, couple other questions. Sure. Um, is it possible to import uh, request data as a CSV or something similar, or will the fields have to be filled in manually? Um, so every application in, in Folio supports um, a, a, a what's called an API, a programming interface, which could be used to insert data. We don't currently have a kind of import function um, that is certainly something that might be interesting to look at for a future version of the application at the moment. Um, but for example, all of the um, all of the requests that you saw populated in the system when I opened this up were populated by me importing a load of data from um, the Open AC APC project. So that's something that I've set up, and it's certainly possible to do without. A huge amount of overhead but there are but it is a technical task so i think you'd need support from a local uh person who understood how to use those apis um uh to import the data but it, it, it certainly can be done without it being too onerous but we don't have a kind of button to click and say import csv um i mean another aspect i mentioned like having help desk systems we know that some people get requests through Kind of third party systems and it would be nice to be able to kind of in synchronize those or or bring them in automatically that's not there in this version okay okay because a, a follow-up question was uh importing uh metadata from like a a, a, a repository uh, like presumably an institutional repository yeah i mean and i think the say the same answer goes there you could certainly do that work with the api that would be possible um but we don't have kind of an easy integration built in that would just work with the, the you know, a, a little bit of configuration at the moment. Is the um, external identifier, is that hard coded to just ORCID or, or somebody asks if if uh, something like VOF uh, would be possible? Uh, we don't currently have other identifiers for people. 
um, I can show a person record when I'm after I've done the request, I'll show what a person record looks like. Mm -hmm. We don't have other identifiers for people. Again, there's no you'll see that we we like we like to support lots of different identifiers. Um, but we haven't done that for the people side of it. We've done it for the publication side of it. Um, uh, I don't see any reason why that shouldn't be extended to to people as well. But it, but it's certainly not in this release. OK, um, is the data that we're entering here for corresponding author only stored within the open access app or is a folio user record also created? No, it's just stored within the app. So we made a decision um, relatively early on not to do uh, an integration with users at this point because um, uh, most users won't make requests and not all people making requests will be users. So we decided that we'd keep that independent. Again, there are definitely areas where we feel like um, it would be nice to have those links and and that's one of them, you know, uh, although it's interesting that um, those two questions kind of, is this like a catalog record and this should be an authority for a person or is yeah. this like a user of the system and it should be linked to their user account is, is an interesting kind of aspect there, I think. But um, yeah, at the moment, it's completely independent. Um, yeah, there's some interesting tensions there, isn't there? Uh, uh, from two different users, I, I would uh, I would point out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you know maybe there's some argument to say you know the user record should include VFIDs as well. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, great. Uh, we're out of questions at the moment. Uh, please press on. Brilliant. Okay, so I also can record a request contact. Um, if that's different to the corresponding author. Now, typically that probably is going to be the corresponding author. So I can just click this checkbox, but if there was some other contact for the request, so this again is meant for internal contact. So maybe someone is an administrator in the organization and all, all the things from a certain department or research group go through that administrator. I, I don't have to have the corresponding author as the only contact on the request. So now I'm down to the the meat of the request, which is like, what is it for? What What's the publication? I'm going to treat this as if I'm coming to this when um, the publication hasn't yet happened. So um, we know some details, but it's only uh, a, um, it's not been actually published yet. Um, so, um, I know that this is gonna be a journal article. And the author has told me that it's an original article. The, the, the values in this list, this subtype list, again, completely up to the institution to decide what goes in that list. I've populated this list um, for the purposes of this demonstration with a set of um, ones I know are used in some cases, but um, this could be, um, you could keep this as long and short as you want. The way that I'm going to use it here is just to um, I'm using a, a list, which then uh, I'm also kind of expecting uh, to be able to say by looking at this subtype, whether that this type of article is covered by my funding or my um, agreements. Um, so that's how I'm using this. Um, because it's up to you to populate that, you decide exactly what values went in there. Um, we know the publisher, in this case, it's Springer, uh, Springer Nature. We don't have a license yet, um, but we do have the publication title, um, which I'll just paste in. And we know who the author names are. It's not been published yet, so there's no URL as yet. Um, we don't have a DOI as yet. Um, we do have the journal. Um, we've been told which journal it's going into, and that is um, uh, advances in health. Okay, so that's not there. So we're going to create a new journal on the spot. Um, so um, and I can add 
the ISSNs as well. Um, to, to preempt maybe some questions, again, um, this, is, this is just in the open access app. Um, these are not lists from elsewhere. Um, obviously, we definitely understand it would be nice if this was able to draw on lists of journals that were already in the system. Um, at the moment, it doesn't do that. It is definitely something I'd be interested in, in being able to do uh, in the future. Um, but for the moment, you enter these individually. Um, again, the APIs are available. And when, um, if I just save this now, when, uh, when you see the list here, um, this is all stuff, again, that I created um, by import via the API um, just this morning. Um, it's not, again, a big issue to do. Um, but it's uh, it just needs that kind of one investment in in getting that import working, and then you can import um, lists. So, is Publisher the same way that that was, it was a drop down list, but it's coming yeah. from previously entered records? Yeah. So the Publisher works slightly differently. The as you could see that the when I enter the um, journal and the person, I can immediately create a new one. Um, the publisher is slightly more tightly controlled. It comes from a list that is um, not available for just any user to edit. So the, ah. we're, we're keeping that slightly more controlled. So it needs kind of set up um, in the system configuration. That's all done by, that can all be done by the UI or by data import. Um, but it just keeps that kind of slightly more tightly controlled than um, allowing um uh just people to create on the fly um that's something that i'm I, I feel we could look at how that works in practice and whether we need to revisit that um as a a, a a better way of doing that in the future but that's how it works at the moment so generally what i'd be looking at there is that in the the initial system implementation i would be suggesting you were getting the the main publishers you think would be used obviously you're never going to cover them all in advance but you'll know the major publishers um in advance and that's you know again this is this is brought in from um that same data set so if i looked at like all the publishers used by my institution in the open apc project for the last uh two three years then that would probably give me a pretty good set um of data and you can see the major ones are here but mm -hmm. Yeah, um, that is something to do with system setup. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, this is a journal isn't in DOAJ. You can see we can record a bit of information about the the journal here. Um, the uh, the uh, whether it's uh, it's OA status and whether it's in DOAJ or not. Um, that information is both on the journal and recorded with the request. So the reason why it happens in both places um, is because the journal might change over time, but the request was done at a particular time. So it's just recording what was true at the point of the request versus what is currently true for the journal. So if later this becomes a, a, a gold open access title, um, then I would update the journal and all future requests would, would then default to gold but all past requests would still be hybrid because they were it was hybrid when they were made. Um, so as I say, this is a this is an accepted publication. So uh, it was accepted for publication on the fourth of August. This is an American date format. Um, for those of you watching in Europe, that's why it's uh, at 10 for 2020. Uh, sorry, 2021. So this is from um, last year. Um, I can add a note here, um, and I can add multiple publication statuses. We'll come back to that later. Um, if I want to record some information about who's funded this publication or the research that led to this publication, I can do. Um, that's uh, another like list defined by the institution. I'm, I'm not going to worry about that right now, um, but but just to say that that's possible as well. And then finally, this agreement. So this is, uh, as we know, a Springer Nature publication. 
and we can look for a spring of nature agreement. So there's a spring of nature agreement here. And uh, we can see that's running from 2021 to 2022. And it's an active agreement. And so that I know that that's, that's the agreement for this um, request. And if I save that request, now I've created that request. So that's the basic request created. And um, all of those details are, are in this request. So I, if I look at this request, I can see I've got the, the corresponding author and um, all of that information. And if I look at the agreement, I also see there are some open access clauses in this agreement. So it tells me immediately from the agreement that um, these are the art allowed articles. Uh, this is how they define corresponding authors. Um, whether there are any additional publication fees. These open access um, uh, clauses from the agreement, that again is completely up to the institution to define. I've defined these as, as what I think would be the useful information you might take from an agreement or contract that says, you know, what kind of articles are allowed. So then we can look and see, okay, so it, is this article one of the allowed articles? Um, it's an original article and yes that's one of the allowed articles um but that that is entirely governed by the institution to deciding which um which properties display here and um what values or whether that's a text field or or whatever so that that's um being brought and displayed here um but i can also if i click on this link actually view the the full detail of the agreement. So this is in the agreements app now. I've left, uh, I've gone from the open access app to the agreements app. And here I can see um, some other information like I've got an open access contact for this agreement. Um, and this is from Folio users. So um, if I have someone in the library who's my main contact for open access on this agreement, uh, that should be me in this case, I guess. Um, I've got information about what journals are included in the agreement. And I've, I've, you can see that some are read access and some are publish access. I've, that, there's just a note to that effect at the moment. There's no kind of special functionality related to that, but that's how I've decided to represent it in this demonstration. And I can also see things like, um, this is a Springer agreement and I've included the OA dashboard information in, in the Springer um details so all of that kind of information you can bring together from other other places in folio and and so hopefully make that uh um folio the place you can record all of this relevant information uh oh yeah the final thing on here is that um obviously in the case of an agreement like this we've probably paid an agreement fee there might not be charges in fact we saw on the properties um there's no additional fees for apcs or anything everything's just covered by the agreement so if i look at the um the agreement line i can see there's a purchase order and that purchase order is linked to an invoice and i can see that i paid a hundred thousand dollars for for this and and all of that information which is so that that's all linked together here so we'll go back to open access request um so we've done the basic information um and i mentioned in my introduction that that there's kind of uh support for uh checklists or help with workflows that you might want to push a request through and that's accessed through this little menu here. And if I open that, we get um, a checklist of tasks or, or things that we need to check for this publication. Uh, again, the list of things in this, the list of things here in this checklist, all these checklist items, completely defined by the organization running the system. These are just ones I've put in for the purposes of demonstration, but that's um, set up you would do up front. When you're implementing the system, you would decide Okay, what are the things, what is our workflow? What, what are the things that each thing needs to check? So 
I say, um, so check for, and uh, that is even down to the, the order in which these are displayed. I've chosen this order. Um, I can dictate exactly which order they display in. Um, so check for publisher agreement. I've done that. So I, that's done. Um, check article fulfills cr agreement criteria. Um, I, I looked at the, the publication type. So I'm, I'm going to say that's done. Uh, check for author affiliation. Um, and if I'm unsure about what this means, I can click the info icon here. Um, and this tells me what it is that this is meant to do. So I should check the institutional directory and then contact the department. And if I um, need to, I can make a note on this. So um, not in directory contacted department. and save that note. And you can see that now there's one note attached to this and, and that the latest note always displays immediately on the card. Um, so if I was to come back later and say, um, uh, department confirmed, then now that that's the latest information, but I can always see the history of those notes as well. So I can check that off. And I could work through these. That That's probably enough for now um, to show you how that works. Um, but there may be things on here that are not relevant. So because this is not going to be invoiced, I don't, I'm never going to need to confirm the invoice is paid. So I can hide anything that's not relevant to this request and I get some hidden um, checklist items here, just so I don't I don't need to say yes or no to those. I can just hide them. Um, so those two are hidden. Let's say, um, well, let's check that off as well. Okay. So I get a checklist for every request, it, and and I can manage those independently. I can also search for things based on checklist um, statuses. So I can look for things where, let's say, um, uh, that um, I've, I've paid the invoice. So I've confirmed the invoice is paid, but um, I haven't yet checked the license. So maybe I can do this kind of search and see if there's anything. Luckily, there's nothing at the moment that that uh, where that's happened, but I can check for different statuses and combine those searches. So the checklist can be used both as just like for this request, where am I? But also to identify requests that have got to a certain stage in the workflow or perhaps more, um, uh, well, and as importantly, got to maybe got to a point where one thing has got ahead of another, like I've, I've everything's done for this, but I haven't checked the license yet. And, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so, but, uh, and, and just to reemphasize all of these options here, they're just ones that I've entered. So you would decide exactly what your checklist items were. And then that would automatically populate those search boxes, those, um, this, this view here. Okay. So that is the that that's the basics. Um, we'll we'll look at another example of a request in a minute, but I wanted to just go over to the um, to the journals and people just to show you that at the start when you open the application, what we're seeing here is a list of all the requests. But we can also search for things by journal. So um, if I'm looking for things that have been published in this journal. Um, I can search for the journal and I can see here's the details. If I need to, I can edit those journal details. So you can see here, this is where I could change if I'd got that wrong or it's changed since I created it. And I can also see all the requests that have been made for articles in this journal. And similarly, if we look at the people, if I look at the person, I can edit their details. 
you can see I've got a little bit more detail here than I had in the quick create. So I can actually add street address information if I need to. I can add multiple email addresses if I need to. Um, there's always one main email address. So those e other email addresses are, are optional. Well, all the email addresses are optional, um, but um, uh, this is what we have for a, um, a person at the moment. And you can see that if I um, look at the requests here, then um, I can see all the requests for that person. So if they get back in touch, let's say they, they get in touch to tell me, great news, that article's now been published. Um, I can go to them, I can find the request, and now we can update this request. Um, so um, the first thing I'm gonna do is add a new publication status because this has now been published. Um, so let's say they told us it was published on uh, the uh, 1st of February this year. Um, so that's the first thing. I might also have uh, got them to confirm some things. So let's say they've given me the DOI. Um, oh, wrong place. I can add the DOI here. I can add the license. So it's a CC BY license, version four. Um, if I had other identifiers, so let's say I've got the PMID, um, I can add that. And the list of identifiers here, this is again, uh, institutional decision. I've just added these, um, these identifiers, but whatever identifiers you want for the article or the book, um, that would be, you know, that you would commonly record, you can, um, have there or, and they're all optional. So you can decide whether you have them or not, but you could add to this list. I've just set up PMID, PMI, CID. Um, and obviously we have ISBNs for books, but, um, you could add uh, as long a list as you want there of other identifiers. Um, we've got publication URL. And if there's a local reference, we've left this as what we call local reference. This is, if you've got say a copy of the article um, in your repository, maybe there's a repository uh, ID um, you want to put in there, or it, you've got a reference to this in your Chris, maybe your, your, your research management system of some kind that could go in there. It's just for whatever local reference you want for the publication. Um, that could be a URL to uh, your repository or a handle or um, DOI from your uh, well, handle from your repository, whatever it is that you have. Um, if you want, again, totally up to you. Um, okay, so I think that's all of the relevant information um, that I've got. Um, so I can save that. And then I can check off that I've now um, completed the publication details. Um, let's assume that I've gone online and checked the publication license is, is correct. Um, and that's this uh, done. Um, so I'm not expecting any charges for this. Um, and so I, I, could, um, I could close it. Um, and um, I should be able to set a reason for closure as well. So I'd expect to be able to say success. Um, I, I, there's a, I've not set that up, so um, I should have set that up as a piece of data I can use. But um, again, the list of reasons for closure down to the institution to set up. So uh, I've just marked this as closed, but um, you might have rejected or successful or completed uh, as a reason for closure. The, so in that way, the, the status, the open closed is just like, what's the stuff I've currently got to deal with versus what's the stuff that's all done. And then the reason gives you the ability to kind of then differentiate things that were closed because it didn't come to publication or it um, it didn't get funded or whatever it is, or just everything's done and it's completely successful and we're happy. Okay. So that's like my kind of ideal 
scenario of a, a request that's all worked. Um, maybe I'll pause there a moment just to see if there, uh, what I'll do, what I want to show next is just some extra functionality and what happens if there's an APC charge. But perhaps just before I go on to that, I'll check there whether there are any questions. Yeah, we just had one pop in. Uh, so uh, somebody's noting that there's a lot of great examples and info on Snapshot. Uh, and the question is, will this data persist for us to look at on our own? Or is this part of what will get wiped out uh, on Snapshot's next refresh? This data will get wiped out on Snapshot with the next refresh, I'm afraid. Yeah. I, uh, um, the the um maybe it's something we could look at including as as a set of demonstration data um at the moment when when a new system is set up um the um the, like for the the, the it, on the folio snapshot system it i think it has a single request in it that is kind of it's all very uninteresting data <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> publisher one and like license one and you know um so yeah i put in um this um so um to to make it a richer environment for uh for this demonstration yeah i'm not sure the mechanics of how we get reference data in but uh I'll we, look at we can probably do some stuff around the reference data it might not be quite as rich as this but we might be able to do better than just publisher one and license one type stuff yeah. uh, and i'll just note that workflow is the first i've seen of that kind of um, uh, user interface uh in a folio app uh that's really exciting kudos to the to the subject matter experts and and the ux designer uh for doing that um that that checklist and and including it in the filters and and the, the richness of of the filters uh that's a, a real exciting addition yeah we're we're really uh, i mean we want to see it you know used in 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 real world situations and i'm sure we'll learn stuff from that but um we're really excited about it too uh that's it for questions uh press on okay so um if we have a um let's uh, say we have an example of maybe a request where um for whatever reason it's not going to be funded so let's say um uh we don't have a publish agreement so there's no publisher agreement um that um or well, no, actually, let's say there is a publish agreement, but it doesn't fulfill the criteria. So um, we're going to have to say to the to the author, this doesn't uh, work. One of the things we can do is add uh, a record of correspondence with the author. Um, this is not um, something like fancy, like bringing email or doing communication from the system, but it's just a way of recording um, some notes on things that have happened. So I could say, um, we corresponded with the author uh, today. Um, we don't need a response, uh, but we could mark something that we, we, we needed. A, 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 we were waiting a reply from the author if we wanted. Um, and we sent them an email about, okay, no, no category here, but um, author know that um, book reviews not included in agreement. And so we could record this now as again like uh oh that's the correspondence. So we can see that correspondence um and then we could uh, mark this as closed. In this case I would have a maybe rejected status here and um and we can so we can record information. Obviously, correspondence doesn't have to be negative like that. It could be positive. It could be like, please, can you let us know um, something? Or it may be, um, and you can see that again. Like we can have um, we can have information about whether we're awaiting a reply 
or maybe it's uh, uh, information from the from the requester and, and we need to respond so we can record correspondence in that way. Um, and finally, the other functionality that I want to show is um, if I find an example, here's an example. So here's a request that we've got um, for uh, a publication um, and it's a uh, gold uh, journal, it's in DOAJ. Everything says to me that we can um, we can pay this out of a, a fund. So there's gonna be a charge for it. Um, this isn't part of an agreement, um, but um, it, so it is something we can fund from some library fund that we have. Maybe it's, um, it's certainly, in, I know in Germany, in the UK, there are um, uh, funds that have been provided in institutions for payment. Um, and obviously there might be local funds that have also been identified. So if there is a, an APC or similar charge for this, we can add a charge uh, to any request. So uh, here we have an APC charge. Um, it's an expected charge. I haven't paid it yet. Um, if I want to add any more description, I can do, but maybe APC is enough in this case. Um, so let's say this is, a, uh, let's say $2,000. Um, if we have a discount, we can record a discount, either a percentage discount or a, a specific amount. So maybe some agreements uh, don't um, have a discount. Um, and um, if this was recovered, recovered by an agreement, we would see this agreement here. So if I'd linked an agreement to this request, and if there was, for instance, again, that property that I'd added, which was um, payment required, then you could put in like 10% discount. Now, again, this is an area where we've discussed with the SIG, like we know that it would be really nice to have 10% discount automatically applied to charges where the agreement defines a discount amount. But at the moment, what we do is we show as much information as that we think the users will find useful on the screen. So that would appear here and then we could apply that um, if we needed to. Um, there's a tax amount. Um, often the APCs are taxable, um, certainly in the UK and in Germany and other parts of Europe. Um, I know that having talked to um, at least one site in America, they, they're not taxed on these payments. And so um, there wouldn't be any sales tax. The 20% figure here comes from a system default that, that again is in the settings. So you, that's applied by default to all new charges. But if I want to, I can make that zero and then there's no tax applied. And if I put zero as the default, then obviously that would just happen every time. So if there was no tax to be applied, it can just be done at a zero rate. Um, the payment period here is for reporting purposes only. So um, as it stands, the, the kind of integration with um, uh, with invoices uh, and and that uh, that uh, and the budgets, if you you'll see in a moment how that works, and all of the detailed payment information would be on the invoice and the the point at which uh, the invoice was paid. So if you wanted to do detailed reporting on exactly what was paid and when, then that would come from invoices and um, the the finance app and you would do the reporting on it in that way. Um, and you could either do it via whatever's already available in, in finance, or that could be done through an external reporting tool. So we have, uh, I think, a couple of integrations with external reporting tools for Folio as a whole. That's nothing special about open access, um, but the library data platform or um, uh, any of the other reporting options that are already available. Um, that said, the reason we have payment period in here is to do some local reporting and I'll show that as well. If you want to do some just um, more uh, simple reporting based only on data stored in the open access app, you can do that. Um, if there's a split of payers, so if for instance, this is being paid partially by the author 
and partially by the library, you can split that down. So um, if there was some kind of split, um, I think typically what we've heard from the SIG is often there's a limit to um, to the amount that the library might pay from a fund. So maybe that's capped at 2000 euro or whatever, and anything additional might be paid by the author. But you can do that split here if you need to. If it's all going to be one charge, you can do that here. You don't have to. You could just record the library part of the charge here if you prefer. So this is the charge. I'm going to save that. So now we can see that charge information. Um, if there's any calculation to be done, that would be done here. We don't have any discount or tax in this case, so that's all fine. And if I look at the charges here, you can see that that's all looking good. I can add multiple charges. So if there was a color charge as well, I could do um, a color charge. Talking to the SIG, we know that not all um, not all libraries record charges they're not going to pay. So if you if you record the color charge, even if you're you're going to pass that onto the author, that's fine. But if you're not going to, you don't have to. You, it's totally down to you. But you would record those as separate charges. And then once we've got the charge, later we might expect to receive an invoice. So you there's a couple of different workflows you can adopt here. You might already have the invoice entered, um, and that's done by the invoice app. Or it might be that you um, you're doing the invoice directly from here. So what we do is we link the charge to an invoice, and if that invoice already exists, we can select it. Or if we need to create a new invoice, we can do that from here. So let's say we've received the invoice today. Um, let's say this is Springer again. Um, and this is all like required invoice, it required information from the invoice app. Um, and now that's created the invoice. To actually add this charge to the invoice, we need to create an invoice line. Um, and that will automatically create from the information it already has the invoice line. And once I've done that, then this is now attached to an invoice. You can see we've got the invoice here, the invoice line here, and these are links to the, the detail in the invoices app. So that's created the data in the invoices app. We don't have any, um, we don't create invoices in the open access app that we, what we do is we collect the information from the user and then that's created in the invoices app. Um, so it, then if I want to add a, a budget a fund distribution, that's where I would do this. So if this is being paid by university allocation, I can say how much is being allocated to that fund and decide you know, exactly who's paying what. And, and all the rest of it is done with the invoices app in the normal way. So um, there's nothing um, kind of a, a additional or different here. And then, um, if I just go back to, uh, so that that can be paid. Um, so that invoice is now linked in here. And um, you can see that when I linked in the invoice, the status of this got updated to invoiced. I can, um, I can further update that to paid. I, we don't know when the invoice is paid, so that is a separate step. Um, again, like exactly how you manage that is up to you, but the um, it will automatically change to invoiced when you link in the invoice line because we know you've done that. But um, if you want it to update to paid, then that needs to be done uh, manually at the moment. And that I think is, oh, one last thing. So that's, that's all that the... Um, yeah, that's everything for the creating the charges and invoicing them. Um, the final thing I just wanted to show was um, was the reporting. Um, so having entered a load of information, if I want to run an open APC charges report, then I can do that. Um, 
so I can um, run. They they the Open APC supports different report formats. There are three um, formats. We've got two in here now, and we're working on the third one right now. So there'll be three eventually here. Um, and so here we say, so this is where the payment period comes in. So it's a way of limiting to only payment that charges that apply in a particular um, uh, period. Um, we can look for which other kinds of charges we want to include in the report and we can use the statuses. So if we weren't, uh, if we were just using expected and invoiced and we were just letting the paid take care of itself in invoices, then maybe we'd use this. But if we were using only paid ones, we could use this. And then we just run that report. And that's not gonna be a very interesting report. Um, and in fact, you won't be able to see that on my screen. Um, let me just share that uh, example. So that's that's the um, that's the report. Uh, not incredibly interesting, but it is the um, uh, the the report format required by Open APC. Um, and um, oh, I just noticed a spe spelling mistake there. Um, I'll uh, I'll need to get that fixed institution it should have an extra t um that institution name actually i should have that's one of the system settings you can put in your own institution name obviously there that you'd want to um and then that would populate it with your institution name which is what's required by open apc the the main focus of that has been to get the open apc formats working but um it will um that that mechanism kind of essentially would work for any information about the charges that we uh, and requests related to them we, we needed to do. So um, it's definitely could be extended in the future to other types of reporting. And I think that takes me to, let me just bring up the, um, that takes me to the end of everything I wanted to show. So hopefully that's given you, I, there's been a lot, um, but hopefully it's given you a real overview of everything that is in the open access app as of now. There are a very couple of small tweaks we're, uh, we're planning to make, um, a couple of bug fixes and uh, the addition of the third open APC report. Um, and then essentially we will do a first release of the open access app at that point. Uh, obviously, um, we're eager to see um, what feedback we get as people start to implement it, start to use it, and uh, hopefully to do more work on it and improve it in the future. Um, and then I will pause for questions and uh, or any comments that anybody wants to make. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I, somebody's mentioning that they love the the ability to to link or create uh, an invoice uh, from the that context uh, in the open access app. Uh, that that's that's really slick. Really, really nice. Um, the correspondence section, I think, is another place where uh, congratulations to the subject matter experts and and the UX designers uh is appropriate because that's that's a, a nifty bit of uh record keeping there as well um somebody asked if if uh waiting for core response uh can that be filtered out uh if needed or, or can, can those be filtered on i think if if needed so we don't have built-in filters for those at the moment i I think it's a really good suggestion. It would be very sensible to be able to bring up everything that was waiting for a response. Um, we don't have that. I will talk to the development team um, and see whether that is something that's possible even like at this stage for, for the release. But I, I definitely think it would be possible for um, uh, future releases. We have very, you can see that we have very similar ideas. Like you can look for all, charges that are expected or all charges that have been invoiced so you can definitely do that kind of filtering already so we can find you know expected invoices and and check whether they've been paid and and that kind of thing 
um, here already. So I think we could do something very similar um, there, um, but we 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 haven't obviously. Um, but I think it would be a nice idea. Uh, speaking of of app release, uh, uh, which folio version uh, will coincide with the initial release for this app? Well, I think that that's still a, a little unknown. In that, from a development point of view, we we're ready to release, and that will that will then be an installable folio module. Um, but that's not the same as being part of what are known as the flower releases, the the kind of um, bundled set of functionality that might be the default by um, someone hosting uh, uh, Folio for you. I know that um, University of Leipzig will be um, installing that first release with um, alongside the other modules. They won't be waiting for a flower release to make that happen. And um, and for any institutions that they are hosting for will obviously benefit from that and that's available to any um, hosting provider if they wish to do so um, having it part of the flower release requires I think a little more work both maybe on our part as development team but also we need to work we don't get to decide whether it's included in the flower release that that's something we have to um, work with the the product council and technical council on um, and so th those are the next steps for us in terms of th there's a process there. Um, we have started that process. Um, there are still some things to to tackle. Um, that I hope won't stop those who are very eager to use this adopting as soon as they like um, or uh, asking their hosting providers to make it happen. But um, yeah, I mean, obviously, we'd love to see this as part of the Falao release um, as well, because it just makes it then the default you know part of the default packages but obviously we have to remember that one of the strengths of folio is that in theory you can you you know you can take the bits that you want and not the bits you don't want but you know there are a lot of institutions in the world who are not currently managing open access requests and they probably don't want this you know in in their system or don't need it in their system at the moment um so you know that is obviously um part of the strength of folio but but from my point of view, uh, it would be nice to be able to say to people, it, it, it will just come with whatever version. Um, in terms of where we are in the the um, the, re the release cycle for the flower versions at the moment, Nalana is currently um, the, the um, next release. It definitely won't be in that because we haven't released this software yet and Nalana is pretty much finalized. Um, uh, the so the the release after that will be orchid um and i guess we'll be having the conversation with the piece the the product council and the technical council to see whether we can uh get this into one of those releases but i think it's worth noting that in the community that there, there's a lot of discussion about exactly how these kind of things should be managed at the moment and so it's hard for us to answer those questions as the developers what we try and do is the best job we can in functionality and hope that that um, encourages adoption and, and we do useful things. So. Yeah, there was a, a lot of discussion at uh, the Wolfcon meeting about uh, the App Store concept and, and uh, uh, platform minimal and, and things like that. So uh, yeah, I, I, would, I would say for Folio users, uh, uh, expect uh, or contribute to that discussion uh, about uh, how we organize ourselves. Uh, another question, uh, is the open APC format the only way of exporting uh, data via the user interface uh, as of now? Right now, yeah. Okay. Um, the, I'm sort of intrigued uh, kind of going back to, to we had the discussion earlier about uh, integration with uh, other apps, uh, and we do know that that some libraries have uh, elected to to uh, start or just to use Folio for its uh, its ERM components. Yeah. Um, you think it might be possible for somebody to use Folio just for this open access app? Uh yeah, I think it would. I mean, there are probably some things to test with that. Um, there's, 
I'm not 100% sure that there might be some tweaks that need to be made to, for instance, hide the option to link to an invoice in the case that the invoices application isn't available. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, um, and I'm not 100% sure just talking to you right now, whether that happens already or whether that's work we'd have to do. But certainly I could see this being done as a very minimal, even putting aside what modules might need to be installed, there's once you've got it running, there's no requirement for you to use anything except open access. So it is designed um, to be completely self-contained in that sense. So even if you needed, it may, obviously, you, even to run a basic folio system, you need some modules available like um, users and authentication. There, there's some stuff that just has to be there. It might be that there's a list of things that have to be there. But once you have that working, in terms of actually the functionality, you could use open access completely independently to everything else because you don't have to link to invoices. You don't even have to link to agreements. As I said at the start, it de I definitely feel like you get a richer experience if you do that, and especially for the agreements. Mm -hmm. But you could do a very minimal implementation of agreements just for open access, and you could use that with the open access application. And I would think that would work really well. I mean, uh, if, if an institution was interested in doing that, um, you know, I, I, I cannot see why, just as the same as you've mentioned for the ERM apps where people have adopted just agreements and licenses or even just licenses as a starting point, I, it would work really well in that in that context as well. Um, absolutely. Great, great work. Uh, so I'm going to pause here for a second uh, and see if there are other questions that come in uh, and uh, also give uh, Jorn a, a chance to uh, come back into the conversation if uh, he has uh, answers or, or other observations that uh, he wanted to add uh, as Owen was doing his demonstration. No, I, th I think that uh, Owen covers everything uh, in this extensive uh, demo. I agree, this is uh, an impressive bit of work. Uh, congratulations to everyone involved. Uh, I am not seeing any additional questions, um, so I think we will uh, bring it to a close. Uh, so this concludes uh, today's uh, forum on the Open Access app. Uh, the recording for this forum will be posted shortly to the Folio playlist on YouTube at uh, youtube.com slash Open Library Foundation. Uh, if you have feedback on today's forum, or if you have an idea for a future forum, uh, please contact the forum facilitators. Our contact information is on the wiki page at wiki.folio.org slash display slash facilitators. Uh, and if there are other special interest groups or, or other development teams that have something uh, that they want to uh, demonstrate. Uh, the uh, facilitators are, are certainly open to that, uh, uh, bringing that up to a forum and, and having that getting a little late in the year, but uh, maybe at the start of the year uh, to come. Uh, thank you to uh, Jorn and Owen, and uh, thank you to everyone who participated in today's event. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks all. Thanks all. Bye-bye.